many discoveries happen at the intersection of different fields and having an interdisciplinary background in engineering, computer science and biology definitely helped me make contributions. Hey, Ram, how's it going? It's going really well. I am enjoying the summer blockbuster season. Yeah, it's true. We did go see Oppenheimer last week. But now that we've had a couple of days to sit with it, what do you think? I think it was great. I was listening to some podcasts that were reviewing it, giving their opinions about it. And I love it. I mean, the fact there was a mixture of science and drama and politics and love and relationships. It was something for everyone. I think that makes for a great blockbuster because everyone can be in entertained and whatever they're really interested in. For me, it's always a science. I mean, talk about quantum mechanics and physics in a way that isn't too heavy. The way that it's described by the main character, Oppenheimer, was very poetic, I felt. What about you? What did you think about the movie? We're recording almost a week later. I think it was an incredibly powerful movie. I highly recommend it. I like what you said. It doesn't go too deep into the science. There is a lot of historical context that I think was missing, but that's impossible to do. It is long. It's three hours, but I felt like there were some hints at the history, which I think were incredibly important to contextualize it. Just visually beautiful. The sound design was incredible. The acting was as good as it gets. Huge thumbs up. Highly recommend it. The question is, when are we going to see Barbie? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what kind of biotech or science takeaways you can get from that. Otherwise, it's just pure fun, I guess. But yeah, let's I put can't that on our list. Yeah, we'll go smack in the middle of the workday. Right. I don't know. Tomorrow's Friday. Well, that's not possible <laughs> since I've gone upstate since our last podcast and since we saw the movie. I know it's incredibly hot in New York city today could be a record breaking temperature. I'm in the Adirondacks where it has been raining like crazy. It rained all morning starting at 6am. It ended around 2. Not a light rain, pretty heavy rain, most of it. The lake is at a high level. The weather's been on our minds. It's been a front page topic because there's been this heat bubble over much of the country and in different parts, parts of the world. What's your take on the weather right now, Iram? I feel like I can't really complain being in New York. I mean, today's 96. I feel like I don't want to say we're used to that. Um, I'm not sure if that's a record. I mean, it is a heat wave. There are warnings, but I know that other parts of the country are getting hit harder. I'm grateful that it's not 120 degrees. This is the world we live in. We talked about this in the last podcast in terms of like the climate anxiety. I don't want to be complacent in terms of, okay, yeah, it's hot. This is the way the world is, but I'm trying to figure out solutions. How can we help the people that have the solutions? How can we highlight their stories and try to cool things down a bit? Yeah. The mission of the Grow Everything podcast is to expose more people to what's happening in the world of biotechnology and biotech is intimately involved with climate technologies as well. Interestingly, we've had a couple of people recently on the pod talking about SynBio in agricultural applications. There was just a big PLOS biology open source online magazine that just ran a huge series on what different researchers are doing in terms of increasing resilience of plants and agriculture in general, because given the, I guess, whipsaw nature of weather changing that is not good for plants. I think it's important. We've also mentioned we're doing a deep dive on cultivated meat. We've got a newsletter that's going to come out that gives an overview. We're going to go deep into some of the cultivated meat related topics. I think it's interesting to be aware. Growers are having a, are going to have a hard time and people who contributed least to climate change are the ones who are being hit hardest by this. Just something to keep our eye on and for us just continuing to educate people on how biotech can make things better is incredibly important. Yeah, biotech is definitely a solution because the earth and us and everyone is of biotech. So how do we leverage that? And we have a lot of guests on the podcast that are doing their part in one way or another. So recommend listening to our episode with Sharav C16. They're making a palm oil replacement so people don't necessarily have to cut down palm tree forests. And then we have also Nicole Richards of Alonia that is doing environmental remediation. So there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen too, right? So we can do prevention, but there is a lot of work to be done when it comes to cleaning our earth and water. We've been talking other potential guests that are coming up with solutions to replace plastics, especially microplastics. That's something you know, now that we're talking to this one company, I'm thinking about a lot that microplastics are in our waters, they're getting into our food systems, whether it's microplastics in the water and the fish are eating it, other animals are eating the fish, we're eating those animals, it's in our bodies, it's accumulating because they don't biodegrade. That is really important topic for me. But yes, climate and biology are related and we will be highlighting those solutions 
solutions and problems throughout our podcast. You mentioned C16. We're excited for this collaboration between C16 Biosciences, Pangaea, and Hackles, which is a UK-based company, to create this soap, which uses the C16 palmless oil, which is a terula oil, which has many of the performance characteristics of palm oil without having to chop down the palm trees. I'm excited for that. I wanted to ask you a question, Iran, because on our list, we do keep a list as we do these intros and outros. You have a list item that says Iram's bio idea. What is that? Oh, yeah, that's going to be like a lot. Sometimes I have an idea that we should talk about and I keep it in like a little word doc here. One is the topic. I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast, but we were talking about it and I'm like, we have to talk about it on the podcast is the adaptive clothing for climate. You and I have talked about it. I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast. This was something that I was thinking very deeply about as it was getting very hot in New York City and then it would rain. What clothing are you supposed to be wearing when one minute the downpour is so severe that the streets are flooding and then the next minute it's so hot that you're sweating? What does that clothes look like? But more importantly, what is the adaptive material that will be developed that enables you to just wear one piece of clothing that adapts to the environment? That was where that idea came from. And I think it's something that we want to find the biotech company or the biomaterials innovators that are working on that so we can talk to them and bring them on the podcast. So if anybody out there knows who that is, let us know. We want to talk to those people. Right. Yeah. Because it would be great. There's linen. Linen helps keep it cool. But what's the material to help drop your temperature by 10 degrees or at least make you feel like other than 96 degrees outside, you feel like it's 80 because you're wearing the special material. Who's thinking about that? Especially when there's a haze, when it's hazy outside in terms of haze from burning rainforests. Or burning boreal forests near the Arctic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, there's a face mask. I know that face mask design is something that a lot of people have thought about during COVID, but we're talking about particle face masks, like the cartridges that are on your face. Or is it like a helmet, almost like a space suit? Do we have to wear something like that to keep us protected in these harsh environments? This is a two-sided coin because we want to be able to stop the climate from acting crazy, but we might have reached the point of no return or it's going to take a while to go back. We're going to have to adapt somehow. And what products do we need in order to make sure that we're safe and we can survive recalibration of the climate? And hopefully all this times out well that you don't have experiences that are too destructive to our communities, which I know is already happening, but we can mitigate that. But in the meantime, we have some you know, innovative solutions to get us through. This idea of adaptive fashion, when you and I initially talked about it, we also started talking about adaptive cosmetics, creams or hair products that would also adapt to the environment based on what's going on, because our skin and hair are damaged by the environment. How does the extreme humidity, how does the extreme heat damage our skin or hair and what who's working on creating those adaptive cosmetics or beauty products that will be able to adapt to that changing climate. Again, I don't know. So if you know anybody, send them our way. We want to get them on the podcast. If there's a product that can be made for people that have straightened their hair and when they go out into humid environments, it keeps it straight rather than curling all up and getting frizzy. That's a billion dollar company right there because (laughs) humidity already damages the style. I know we are talking about extreme damage to hair. I'm talking more about just stylistically. I spend time blowing out my hair. People spend money for that. They might spend 80 bucks at a place called Dry Bar where they dry your hair out or blow your hair out. But then they go outside and it all gets curly or frizzy or messed up. It's not just about gloom and doom, but it's also about people's expression and how they want to be seen. But unfortunately, the climate or environment messes up their look. So anyway, we could talk about that for a while. All right, let's get into the podcast. We're about to talk to Eduardo Abeluk, who is the co-founder and CEO at Tesselogen. And Tesselogen is a company that has developed a suite of automations tools, they're software-based, for the biotech industry. Eduardo does a fantastic job of keeping the conversation very high level. There are a couple of places where it does get a little bit complicated, but he does a great job in this interview. Iram, what do you want to say as we introduce Eduardo? It can be complex what they do at Cellogen, but ultimately it is an automation platform. Everything is becoming automated, the manufacturing of cars, the manufacturing of lots of different products, and the manufacturing of biological products. So really, that's the big key takeaway. That's what Detelligent does. But it's also very interesting to see how he breaks it down and presents this solution to the industry. It's a very, very helpful and insightful conversation. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Well, let's get into the interview. 
Hello, Eduardo. It's wonderful to have you on the Grow Everything podcast. We're very excited to speak with you and have you share your work and how you've been participating in the biotech industry and help growing this industry. Why don't we get started? And can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in biotechnology? Hi, Aram. Hi, Carl. Thank you for having me. I'm also really excited to be here. A little bit more about my background. I always felt attracted to math, to science, to technology. My interest in biology actually developed throughout my graduate studies. My undergrad was in physics and electrical engineering in Chile. While I was doing my undergrad, I was able to get some internships in in Silicon Valley. I did an internship in Motorola, completely unrelated to biology or biotechnology. This was when I was like 20 years old, studying back in Chile. I did well in school. And as soon as I graduated, I moved to the U.S. I spent a year in Boston working for electrical engineering professors at MIT. Uh, That experience definitely shaped me, but I wanted to pursue a PhD. So I moved to California, Silicon Valley. I did my PhD formally in electrical engineering. I became a research assistant at the Information Systems Lab, which is known for a focus on developing algorithms for information processing and their applications to science and engineering in general. That's when I started becoming interested in AI and machine learning and exploring applications in engineering and particularly in medicine and biology. I always had an interest, as I mentioned, in science, and it was really fascinating to learn about about the opportunities coming from biology, from genetics, where a lot of data was being generated. And biologists didn't really have the tools to parse the information and to effectively generate biological insights using computer science. So my research focus was in computational biology and molecular biology. I spent a number of years at Stanford's Beckman Center for Molecular and Genetic Medicine, where I was working under Lucy Shapiro and Harley McAdams, studying the regulatory networks driving the cells cycle of a tiny microbe called Caulobacter crescentus. I spent a number of years myself also doing experimental work, molecular biology, chasing some small RNA molecules that we believed existed but were yet to be discovered. And we did this by trying to pick signals from huge data sets coming from microarray experiments full of experimental noise. I was performing some tricky experiments called northern blots that involved tagging RNA with radioactively labeled probes. These experiments were not easy. We definitely needed some algorithms that could predict the existence of these small RNAs, then validate their existence independently through these experimental assays. So I came up with a simple algorithm that used some machine learning and statistics to find them. Luckily, it worked beautifully. We discovered 27 novel small RNA molecules in Caulobacter. That work was featured on the cover of the Journal of Molecular Microbiology. And that first paper, I think, was the one who got me interested in biology. But importantly, I think it showed me how valuable and critical it was to to apply skills coming from computer science into biology. Many discoveries happen at the intersection of different fields and having an interdisciplinary background in engineering, computer science and biology definitely helped me make contributions. For me, biotechnology then represented a very exciting opportunity to combine my interests and create innovative solutions that could help speed up scientific discovery. Yeah, I find that background so interesting, Eduardo, because one of the things we tell a lot of people is that so much biotech happens these days computationally. So I'm curious, a couple of questions, like coming into the lab and joining this group, how much of your time was actually spent doing computational work versus lab bench work? I thought that the amount of bench work that I was doing was quite significant. A typical day might include reviewing some data from previous days and previous experiments, analyzing the results and and planning the next steps. But then when you start doing some of these experiments, some of them can take quite long. You measure them in, if you're lucky, in days, but typically in weeks or months. I was doing work in microbiology where you work with E. coli, used heavily in industrial biotechnology and for research purposes. It's a tiny microbe that divides. It takes 20 minutes for a single cell to multiply, divide, and become two cells. And then you can grow an E. coli culture overnight. You can go from one cell to maybe a billion cells in half a day or so. If you're like dealing with mammalian cells, they can take half a day to divide, to simply double. Then you might have to wait a couple of weeks to grow a culture. So it can take time. I spent myself a number of years pursuing experiments that didn't go anywhere. Over a year, pursuing some ideas that didn't work out, working day and night in the lab. Typically, you, you set up some experiments and then 
and while you're waiting for the cells to grow, you might do then some computational work. There might be some weeks where you are focused on working in front of a computer and thinking about the experiments, planning the experiments, and another set of weeks really focusing on the experiments. It can vary a lot, but it depends. Some people are scientists or bioengineers has their own strengths and uh, focuses. To me, I was trying to spend as much time as possible in front of a computer analyzing data, but sometimes it simply takes weeks or months to go through all these experiments and gather the data. Yeah, you can't really rush biology in its natural way. Of course, you can create models and do some prediction. It's great that you've shared your experience with electrical engineering, with computer science, with biotechnology. There are several of our listeners that are software engineers, so hello to all of our software engineers who are looking to see how they can contribute and participate in biotechnology and where is their place in the space. But for you, what you've done is you've created a company, Tesselogen. What was that specific moment that inspired you and your team to create Tesselogen? Like, why did you create this company? Yeah, so we started Tesselogen. One of the things that we saw was a gap in the biotechnology industry we could address with the rapidly advancing field of synthetic biology. Specifically, we realized the potential to design and construct track new organisms for a number of valuable purposes was largely untapped. However, designing and building and testing biological systems is complex. The traditional methods used in the field were often time-consuming and error-prone. Personally, based on my experience planning and doing experiments, I felt that many of the things you know that I was doing as I was planning the experiments could be automated. I personally wanted to create software that could simplify and accelerate that process. So instead of spending my time planning the experiments, I could would rather spend the time reading the literature or, or thinking about different ideas. But me started with a couple of colleagues that we met at Stanford to start the Cellagen. We have developed a software platform that currently uses a number of advanced computational tools and machine learning techniques to optimize the so-called design, build, test, learn cycle in biotech research and development. At the core, our mission is to also empower other biologists and bioengineers across every research and development team, enabling them to rapidly create bio-based products while minimizing costs, speeding up the process, minimizing technical risks by biological products for the next generation of anti-cancer drugs, the next generation of materials, food ingredients, enzymes, biofuels, microorganisms for different industrial uses, you name it, to pursue this vision, we've been actively creating an extensive set of tools and algorithms for optimizing DNA and proteins and tools for helping you and helping the community to define and execute the corresponding experimental workflows, specifically workflows that touch DNA, which has been our focus throughout the past number of years, and which is at the core of what biotech companies do. They design and build DNA. More recently, we've been designing and implementing some AI models that can be trained with data that characterize characterizes the properties or the phenotypes of these biological products and it be used to optimize these biological phenotypes. It has been quite an exciting journey. We are very excited, particularly these days, there's a lot of conversations around AI and generative AI. And definitely this is something that is of interest to us. It is an important aspect of our work, but we also understand that equally or more important is to develop the upstream and the downstream tools that are needed to gather the data, to plan the experiments, to interface with lab automation and so on. I really believe that biology has an enormous potential to address some of the world's most pressing challenges from climate change to healthcare. And I'm really excited to be part of bringing that potential to fruition. When Eduardo talks about upstream and downstream processing, he's talking about something that is pretty common to fermentation and biotech. Upstream processing is all the tasks and all the things that happen as you start a fermentation process. So that might be developing the microbes. It might be developing the nutrients that you're using to feed them. It's cell culture. It's cell separation. It's harvesting. That is all upstream processing. Downstream processing happens after the cells have grown for a while and produced the product you designed them to produce. So downstream processing refers to the recovery and purification of bio products. Downstream processing is crucial in manufacturing because it's where you isolate the antibodies, the hormones, the vaccines, the enzymes, and you purify them and ready them for the market. 
That's so great, Eduardo. Could you give us a picture of when a company would start using Tiseligen's product and how they might use it? Because you talked about tools for designing DNA, also the development of these AI models, and then also generating data from upstream and downstream processes. But where's the place where someone, you know, Iram and I start a biotech company, at what point do we come to you to start using your tool or your solution? Our solution, we've been working on it for a number of years, and currently it's composed of a number of different modules, specifically four different modules that we call the design module, the build module, the test module, and the discover module. Typically, we see users and companies. And when I talk about companies, we have small, high people, startups, you know, using the cell agent to publicly trade the companies. You don't have to be like a large company to start using the cell agent. We also have some tools and some editions that are open to the public, the enterprise edition of the platform. It's a more advanced product that we license typically to companies. But anyone could start using the cell agent right away. And typically, we see users onboarding the design module or the community edition or the starter edition. Before doing any experiment, you have to plan your experiments. Of course, there are a number of other tools out there that the community uses, but what makes the cell agent quite unique and it's kind of like a trend that we see in biotech is unlike 10 or 20 years ago when scientists were designing one DNA construct at a the time, they are now designing more and more complex combinatorial DNA libraries. And that's where our design module comes comes with a number of powerful tools that help you design these, for example, combinatorial DNA libraries that could be composed of thousands of different individual DNA constructs, and it will help you figure out how to build them. Typically, you have to assemble DNA, you have to order some oligos, you have to order some short DNA fragments, and then you might have to do some molecular biology experiments to clone DNA, to assemble DNA, and throughout the process, you have to be designing some experiments common in by technology. You'll typically have to be amplifying DNA using a PCR. And PCR is used for a number of protocols, but specifically if you're like building DNA, at some point you need to amplify DNA and you have to be designing short fragments of DNA called oligos. The cell agent will help you automate all that. It will design your oligos, your primers automatically, and it will help you design your PCR reactions and so on. It will help you get started. Then typically at some point you have to run the experiments and that's when we see users starting to use the build module of the cell agent, which is like a lab information management system that can help you track everything that you have in the lab, track your samples, manage your inventory, define experimental workflows and, and execute them. It has been designed to work very tightly with the design module, for example. So when you're designing something and then you need to build it, the design module will generate automatically a protocol for the specific instructions for you to then build whatever you're trying to build. Namely, for example, as I was mentioning, a combinatorial DNA library. And we don't see this happening from the get-go, but eventually, after maybe a number of months or even years, we see users and companies gathering data and start using the other tools that are you know, more valuable when you have large data sets that you can link to your experimental workflows and that you can link to your genetic designs and then train some models to generate some insights. But that typically comes on a second phase, I would say, that makes sense. Yeah, that's really great. And I really appreciate how you guys package your modules in the design, build, test, discover what we call it the DBTL, where the discovery is actually the learning, but that's the same thing. So that's really great that you have packaged this product because then it helps other companies think that way as well, because that's the only way they would be able to use your products. You have a startup edition. So it looks like when Carl and I do start a biotech company, we'll be able to work with the cell agent early. So I'm very excited to get our hands dirty when we ever we get there. It got me thinking, but that's for another podcast. So that's really helpful to know. I know now that you guys have been around for how long again? How many years has cell agent been around? For uh, 10 years already. Wow. You've been around, you've built out your product. What was the first product that you guys actually created? The first product actually was some core features that we had in our design module. Initially, the design module was the Tesselagen platform and it didn't have all the tools that we currently have in the design module. And then we started, you know, expanding it and developing the other three modules. Have you had a company come in and start their company from scratch and use Tesselagen? Or did they end up finding the hard way because they were doing things more manually and they're like, this is taking up way too much time. Is there any Anything out there that can automate this? So we've had both type of companies approach the cell agent. Some of them started using some other tools. We see many companies use spreadsheets or use you know, mm -hmm. conventional electronic lab notebooks, which are great and are used heavily by academic groups. But then when you're like trying to build experiments that scale, okay, you need a more structured system that can help you plan your experiments at, at scale. But we all also had recently some small startups heard about the cell agent and saw the value and started using it right away. It's a combination of both. 
would say. For example, a small company that started using the cell agent from the get-go was a company based in Virginia called Urobio. That is a company that's using synthetic biology to engineer microbes that eat organic waste and produce bioplastics that have the potential to significantly reduce the environmental impact of the plastic industry. We had some other companies in this space with larger startups that I think came out are using the cell agent a little bit later in their life. For example, a company called Protein Evolution based in Connecticut, which is also engineering new enzymes that can effectively break down plastic waste and create good as new plastic material. It's incredibly rewarding to see how our technology can contribute to such solutions that we can help them transition to a more scalable process and ultimately transition the planet to a more sustainable economy. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the other thing too, Eduardo, talking to you and hearing you talk about Tisellagen and your background is what it demonstrates is that you've worn multiple hats. And like you said, a lot of discoveries, and I also think the most significant discoveries are made at this convergence of multiple technologies. You got your PhD, you started Tisellagen, you worked at a venture fund. What are some of the most important takeaways that you've gotten so far from that journey of yours? Yeah, for sure. Each role I think that I've taken on has offered invaluable experiences that have shaped me as an entrepreneur. So you mentioned spending some time at the venture fund. That gave me an entirely different perspective. It gave me insights into what investors look for in a company, different stages and the factors they consider when deciding whether to invest or not. And also how a fund is structured on their own unit economics, what are their own incentives. I learned to appreciate the importance of having a clear and compelling value proposition with an an ambitious long-term plan, but also a very clear short-term plan. The importance, of course, of having a sound business model, the ability to scale, understanding the importance of going after a meaningful market, understanding the competitive landscape. I would say all these experiences that I've had, either working for a venture fund or other companies, teaching at Stanford and so on, I think it underlined the importance of people in any organization and the importance of understanding who is on the other side of the table, whether it is inspiring students to learn and trying to understand their cognitive biases or working with other founders who are passionate about their startups. It's the people that truly make the difference. As an entrepreneur, this has taught me to develop empathy, to focus on building a strong, talented team and fostering a culture of hard work and mutual respect. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm listening to you and I hear you're helping really create like a lot of foundational technology to help these companies scale up, build up in a faster way. It does remind me a lot of AWS um, and how they help software companies rapidly prototype and grow their software products. Is that how you think about Tisellagen? Do you see yourself as a platform enabling technology to help accelerate biotechnology development? To some extent, yes. For us, it's empowering a number of small companies to larger publicly traded companies in different fields. We currently have users and customers across multiple continents and it's offering tools that many of these tools have been developed already in-house by some large companies, but they don't make them available to smaller companies. And I think there's a lot of value to building that infrastructure and opening it up so that others can also benefit from the tools, from the algorithms, from the infrastructure. And it's not just the tools like AWS or some other cloud platforms. For us, it's also about building what we call an operating system for biotechnology because for us, interoperability is also at the core of what we want to build. We see many companies that see value in the tools that we provide, but they also have their own secret sauce. They may have their own algorithms or their own tools and registry of parts and data sets. They also need to have a good infrastructure that can help them connect their own algorithms with our own powerful tools, but also with third-party databases, public databases, also integrates with different vendors, particularly, for example, DNA synthesis vendors like Twist or IDT, which sell DNA. Users can be designing in the cell agent and then they may need to order some reagent or some DNA and they can easily score those sequences, check if they could be synthesized by a vendor and then even automatically generate an order form so that they can get the reagents or DNA to build their experiments. I think there's a lot of power building such an infrastructure where you can have multiple microservices like AWS has, but also good APIs, good ways of programmatically interfacing with external systems so that you can also 
integrate other tools also into your cloud-based framework. You, just to make it clear to our readers, when you're talking about interoperability, Eduardo, what you really mean is largely this idea of being able to integrate into other tools and then also external services. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. When I think about interoperability, you know, at the high level, you think about four main categories of integration. On one hand, external databases. There are some great public databases of genetic information like NCBI. We can easily pull data from NCBI into our platform or from some other third-party database. And we have what we call a microservice framework that we have a number of companies. I think you mentioned Lansatec. So Lansatec has its own colon optimization algorithm that they use that is optimized for the type of organisms and aerobic microbes that they are optimizing. They use the cell agent, but they also use some of their own tools, like their own colon optimization tool, and they interface those tools developed and run within their own firewall with the cell agent. Then in a third category of integrations are the vendors, DNA synthesis vendors, for example, and automation equipment. At some point, you also want to integrate with some equipment and you want to automate your workflows. So we've also developed some tools so that you can more easily interface with uh, with those automation equipment like robotic liquid handlers. That makes a lot of sense. You mentioned coming from Chile to California and Tisseligen is a Chilean California company. How's the team split? Who's down in Chile and what is the biotechnology world of Chile look like these days? Yes, when we went through COVID, we became a remote company, even though officially the headquarters are in California. Now, currently, the team is spread across a number of countries, even within the U.S. We have a number of people in California, but we also have people on, on the East Coast, in Virginia, currently in Florida. We have people in Indianapolis, in Oregon. I'm originally from Chile. I always wanted to open an office in Chile. So we have a number of engineers working from Chile. We have people from other countries, from Mexico. I think there is a lot of talent in Latin America. I'm particularly interested in trying to identify those people and particularly the ones that are interested in technology and in biotechnology. And I've seen how the biotech community in Latin America is slowly but steadily growing. We have a number of interesting companies that are coming from Latin America in general and specifically from Chile. There's, I think, at least three or four Chilean companies that we follow and that we have a good relationship with. You know, one of them is NACO, food tech company. I don't know, maybe you, you might have heard, heard about it. There is H Technologies. We also had a Cura Biotech. It's another cool company. And they were also at BioBeta earlier this year in California. We, we are seeing a number of biotech startups emerging from Latin America and also venture capital funds that didn't exist a few years ago that are now focusing on investing in biotech startups in uh, regions like Latin America. Yeah, I mean, I think that's great that you have a team of people in different countries around the world. This is the type of organization that we're seeing more and more. We've seen it obviously in the software engineering world, but when it comes to biotechnology, oftentimes people think that they have to be in a lab located somewhere that's not a city because it's cheaper and that's the only way to build a biotech company. But thinking of the cell engine and how you have a remote workforce, that's really interesting to us. One of the things that we have been talking about at Messaging Lab and then top of conversation at Synbio Beta has been the concept of a DAO. What is a DAO? Distributed Autonomous Organization. The concept of being able to use lab services remotely. Like as you can imagine that someone being on a beach but being able to do a fermentation run remotely. Is Tisseligen a part of that world? How do you see Tisseligen being remote? How do you see it help DAOs in particular? Yeah, you mentioned a number of interesting trends and topics, DAOs, maybe orchestrating experiments from the cloud and so on. Specifically about DAOs, I'm very excited about the opportunities that blockchain technology can provide to different industries, including biotech. To me, you know, what's relevant about blockchain technology in general is that it is designed to provide a decentralized and transparent and censorship resistant way to process information. And it's great for applications where you don't want to rely on a few centralized entities that control the flow of information, like a bank, for example. And then it specifically represents a fascinating evolution in how people could eventually use blockchain technology to organize themselves and make collective decisions. And they provide a model of governance that is built on transparency and direct participation and governance rules that could be automated, the so-called smart contract. I haven't personally worked with any biotech DAO. I had some experience looking at other DAOs, my own personal interests in the DeFi space, in decentralized finance. I really appreciate all the potential that they bring in for creating more democratic and decentralized structures. In finance, it's much easier to translate an application into a smart contract to automate. And there are many applications where it makes a lot of sense to use blockchain technology and, and we're seeing it. We have a number of protocols in DeFi that 
that are you know, gaining significant traction. However, in biology and in biotech, it's a little bit more tricky when you're moving stuff in the physical world, moving samples from a freezer to a bench or a bioreactor, and it's harder to automate. Not impossible, but there are still some steps that you might want to have some basic level of human intervention because of the unpredictability of the outcomes. The examples that I see are not truly automating the whole stack, like in finance, but maybe biotech using DAOs and blockchain to incentivize more collaboration. That's quite exciting. For example, you could create a DAO for creating a collective fund that invests in projects defined by the community where anyone can participate and the allocation of funds is very transparent. One example of such a DAO is Theta DAO, which is a collective fund dedicated to, to advance longevity science research that can improve people's lives. Another possible application is on how academic research is performed and reviewed. You could open it up to the community, you know, anyone eventually maybe such a DAO could participate and have the community do the peer review and maybe even incentivize peer reviewers with a token. In general, I think these DAOs are a great platform for incentivizing collaboration across multiple teams to work towards a common goal, maybe even tokenize some IP rights and track that IP on a blockchain. There is one called Ballet DAO, I believe, that focuses specifically on collaboration around Symbio projects. I'm eager to see how this one evolves. In an ideal world, I think these labs would enable scientists anywhere to contribute to a research project, creating a truly global and collaborative approach to science. As for Tesla Gen, I see that our role would be really an enabler and accelerator of this transition because we really want to enable companies, empower them, startups, academic labs to have access to the tools and services they need to plan their experiments. We still see that many small companies, even probably more importantly, larger companies, they still want to have control on their experiments and run their work in-house. I'm not sure if that's going away anytime soon. And to that extent, you know, Tesla Gen is helping them to do so by providing them access to the tools and infrastructure to manage their own experiments. But we don't hold data hostage. As I mentioned, we're already integrating with a number of tools and a number of third-party services. But I agree this decentralized model would really democratize even further access to biotechnology and maybe open new ventures for collaboration. Yeah, I'll just make a comment. So I did an interview with Ari Lippman, who's one of the founders of LabDAO, not for the podcast, but before we started the podcast. And LabDAO is focused on really creating a lab in the cloud for people. The thesis there is that if you're building for the people who enable experiments Experimentation on the cloud, that could be a very good place to go. I'm sure that your tool integrates very nicely in that. And then the other areas which you touched upon are DAOs that are very specific to investing in different areas of research or creating tokens that make it easier for people to invest in research for a very particular disease. You mentioned Valley, but there's also Molecule and Hair DAO is also out there doing hair and stem cell applications for hair. What we haven't seen yet and what I'm looking forward to to, and I think Andrew Hessel had mentioned this, was really DAOs that are, for example, we've got these BioBricks consortia that has the database of DNA parts. That seems like something that is primed to be put into a DAO structure, giving people access to those genetic parts, the digital versions of the genetic parts in a way that has been verified. So I think there's a lot of exciting things that potentially can happen in that space. And we're still very early in those developments. I completely agree. And this might take a few years to develop. But there is definitely this whole movement around, you know, the web 3.0 and how blockchain technology can facilitate this new architecture to build applications and to collaborate and build the incentives so that we, we can collaborate in a more decentralized manner is really, really exciting to me. I'm following it very closely. That's great. Thanks so much for your insight over there. DAOs can be a, a pretty complex topic. So let's switch gears and ask a more simple question. How did you guys come up with the name Teselogen? What does it mean? And how did you come up with it? Yes, the word Teselogen Tesselagen comes from Tesela and Gen. Tesela coming from the word tessellation, which it's not like a very common word, but it's a grouping of basic tiles. So, and Gen from a gene or DNA, a genetic element. It's this idea of having a concept. When you're designing, you're creating some sort of tessellation, if you will, of genetic elements. That was kind of like the inspiration for the name. We spent a few months trying to come up with the name. It's not easy. If you want something that can stick with you for the next 10 years, I think sometimes it's not easy to come up with the name. Oh, yeah. 
telling us, we work with a lot of clients on helping them with naming and it is one of the hardest Very challenging. Things. Yeah. yeah, it's very challenging. And this is probably a little more of a hard hitting question. And, and also just for me and our audience is I asked a question earlier about how can we compare to sell it into something that's a little bit more familiar and I threw AWS out there. Ginkgo uses that type of comparison to their platform saying that they are like the AWS for synthetic biology. I know that there's a lot of automation. You have a very comprehensive platform and Ginkgo is really looking at engineering organisms specifically. Where are some of the biggest differences and commonalities between your company and Ginkgo? We see ourselves as a quite different company. They have some software tools, had some conversations with them throughout the years. They are mostly running their own experiment. We are a pure software company. We are deploying our tools so that they can be used directly by our own customers. We're not like basically working with our companies and running their experiments for them. It's a different model. Sometimes I like to think about the synopsis for biotechnology or the cadence for biotechnology. These are companies that are not well known by most of your audience. But coming from electrical engineering, I was for a number of years interested in and following the semiconductor industry. This is an industry that developed throughout the past several decades. And you had a number of big players that were in the business of building integrated circuits in the same way a number of biotech companies or CROs or building biology. But as the field, as the semiconductor industry started to evolve, then you really needed sophisticated software tools to empower these companies that were designing and building integrated circuits to design their chips. And there was a whole new industry that emerged that is called electronic design automation or EDA. It's currently you know, quite large industry dominated by a few players like Synopsys or Cadence or Mentor Graphics. As you started trying to put more and more transistors on a chip, you really needed a number of advanced tools to design, to build, to do what is called in EDA, play some routing of the transistors in the chip. We see a similar trend emerging with biotechnology. Biotechnology is a huge industry. It's getting more sophisticated. The designs in terms of the complexity of the libraries that you're building, that you're screening, the length of your DNA sequences, all this driven also by something similar to Moore's law, where it showed that the cost to a certain number of transistors on a chip was reducing by half every 18 months or so. Similarly, the cost to synthesize DNA has been dropping exponentially. There's some analogies I sometimes like to make with what is happening in biotech, with what happened a few decades ago in the semiconductor industry. Some people call this maybe emerging field biological design automation. I think it's something that probably within the next five or 20 years might be much more consolidated. But definitely, if you look at the number of biologists in the U.S., I was checking this number not too long ago. You have over 100,000 biologists, which is as many or more as the number of electronic engineers in the U.S. And they, for a long time, have been using low throughput tools and conventional tools, spreadsheets, electronic lab notebooks or whatnot to design biology. But I think it's going to radically change within the next 10 years. Yeah, I'm glad that you bring that up, Eduardo, this idea of electronic design automation. I think most people don't realize that chip design is so complex that it actually is beyond human comprehension. That's why you have this industry that's grown up. It used to all be done by hand. Our friends at Asimov have some pictures of these large tables that have chip designs on them. And if you go and you search for them, you can see that this was all done by hand, but it quickly became very, very complicated. And so the companies you mentioned, Synopsis and Cadence, who are designing those chips, they're using a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning tools. Now, biology is all say infinitely more complicated than chip design because cells have many processes happening simultaneously. In fact, they have so many processes happening simultaneously at such great speed that we still don't know how many processes happen in a cell at any given time. You can take a snapshot picture of a cell and what you will get is a picture in time, but you don't really understand everything that goes on. So I agree with you 100%. We're going to see these biodesign automation companies. Some of them exist. More of them are going to exist very quickly and we'll see some consolidation. And ultimately what it does is it's going to make the job of the biologist a lot easier than it currently is. Definitely. And I completely agree with what you said. And like electronic engineering and the semiconductor industry where basically what you're doing is you're solving Maxwell equations, computing electromagnetic fields, trying to predict crosstalk between the electronics that, that flow from one transistor to the other, with the interfering with electrons that flow to other transistors and so on. But in biology, it's hard. We don't, unlike mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, we don't have yet good laws and equations that we can solve to simulate what the biological system will do. Of course, there are some equations that allow you to predict certain things 
things, but the system is so complex that you're far away from understanding it and predicting it. And that's why I am particularly very excited about the intersection between AI and biology, because we don't really understand them, but we're gathering a lot of data and we can start building complex nonlinear models that can start learning. Eventually, I think maybe some of the underlying processes that are happening, at least with some degree of predictive power. So that's kind of exciting, maybe the application of AI into biotechnology. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think a lot of people are talking about that. You were at Symbiobeta and AI was definitely front and center for our industry of biotechnology. And like you said, it's going to provide insights that we never had access to. Being able to process all that data and make sense of the complexity, it's going to be very interesting what we learn. But since we're nearing the end of our our, our interview here, there's some questions that we just like to ask all of our guests. I'm curious, and I know you work with lots of biotech companies. You've met many over the years. Can you share like a biotech company that you admire in terms of the product that they're creating for the end consumer and why? Certainly. We are industry agnostic and we work with uh, a number of the companies across a number of different fields from biopharma to industrial biotechnology. We work with some academic labs with Harvard, Caltech, Stanford, uh, doing really cool stuff. We already talked about a few, Urobio and Protein Evolution. Another great company that I really like and admire, and we've been working with them for a number of years, is a company called Lansatec, which is based in Illinois and uses synthetic biology to convert industrial waste gases into sustainable fuels, ethanol, and other high-value chemicals. This is one of the companies that has the potential to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve the sustainability of various industries, from steel production to transportation. They, they have developed and optimized an aerobic micro eats carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and produces all these high value compounds. So it's a really cool company. We've seen them grow since they were a privately held company to now becoming a publicly traded company. And it's a great example of how biotechnology can really help us move towards a more sustainable economy. Yeah, we have met Lons Attack. We haven't had them on the podcast yet, but we will certainly bring them on soon, hopefully. It's just a great example of leveraging biotechnology to create products that people can touch and feel and understand and start getting more interested in accepting of biotechnology, which, you know, in the past might have had a bit of a controversial flair to it, aside from biopharma. But when we talk about GMOs, which we are trying to clarify and make exciting, but there's good and bad for everything. It depends on how you apply it. So thanks for sharing that one. And we certainly will hopefully get Lanza Tech on the podcast soon. If you're listening, give us a call. And maybe, yeah. Eduardo, you can make an introduction. For sure. We're very close to them, for sure. I'll send them eventually this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we want to be very mindful of your time. Eduardo, was there anything that we didn't cover that you wish that we would have before we close out the pod? We cover a quite a number of topics. Wanted to thank you again for the opportunity to share some of these developments and help the community also learn more about biotechnology, all the different cool applications and the different tools and technologies that are being developed. I think there's a very bright future for biotechnology for the upcoming years, definitely at least the next 10, 20 years. It will be quite exciting. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Thanks. It's been great to talk with you. Thank you so much for building this company to help accelerate biotechnology technology and transition us from a petrochemical, chemical-based toxic world to a more biodegradable, bio-friendly world. So thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Iram, what did you think of that interview? I loved it. First of all, Eduardo being someone who has expertise in different disciplines and able to converge all of those disciplines into coming up with such an elegant solution that is to sell again. I think that's how a lot of people are going to be thinking. And that's how a lot of innovation has happened. As he mentioned in the podcast, it's a convergence of multiple disciplines. Um, and we're going to see a lot more of that happening because people have access to a lot of science and research at their fingertips and then throwing the layer of AI on top of that. All these insights that are going to pop up is just going to be amazing. And it's very exciting to hear how Eduardo has brought concepts of engineering, computation, and biology together. Him and his team, I know Eduardo is not a one-stop shop. It's not just him. I know it's many people at Tisalogen making this happen. And I think it's just a great way for people to think of how they can approach the solutions as not just thinking of an engineering way of solving something, but there's multiple disciplines that can be leveraged to come up with solutions. People say innovation happens at the edges and convergence is one of those 
those things. This idea of being multidisciplinary, I think, is really interesting and very key. I'm sure if we sat down and kind of made the list of people who've been on the podcast, several of them are these kind of multidisciplinary experts that have focused their expertise on biology. We are for a messaging lab. We are and we have entrepreneurship and marketing and communication. So we converge those three disciplines. They're not super deep tech. That's when things get a little crazy. But at least for us, we have that convergence to be able to help solve very specific challenges that biotech companies face. This is true. And Eduardo talked a lot about the use of AI tools, which we have increasingly been using. We say we use it to solve blank page syndrome. I've probably said it before on the podcast. I do find that using a AI tool like Grammarly to double check things I write makes it possible for me to write a little bit faster. And then using ChatGPT or its ilk. So I think you'd written another note, Iram, which I think is really important. And I think we should get into it a little bit is this idea of using automation or AI tools to 10x your company, your ideas and yourself. He was very passionate about using Tiseligen to automate the planning of experiments. So that way he could have more time to study literature and reading papers. I know we here at Messaging Lab have recently read a book called 10x is easier than 2x. And so we've been thinking a lot about automation and how do we become more effective at the work that we do for our clients. And I think Eduardo, the way he talked about it just made a lot of sense. What do you think? Yeah, I was thinking about this a lot because part of the book, they talk about in order to 10x yourself or your company. And of course, that means your revenue and you're looking at your workday and where you're spending time. And if you're not growing, you're technically doing like 80% of the work is keeping you stagnant. And it's that 20% of work that will get you to the next level. So how do you offload that 80% of work, whether it's someone else doing it or using automated tools so that you don't have to spend time doing that 80%, you can expand your focus to that 20% and then that 20% can help you level up. So that's, I thought was really fascinating. I mean, I know we're looking at ways to do that here at Messaging Lab is to figure out what can we offload? We have been using ChatGPT. That's been saving us a lot of time. So for some things, we are looking to hire some people to help offload some other work. So I think that it's not just for people that are entrepreneurs or like CEOs or people that are in business, but really for anyone, like the concepts that were in the book were just really helpful. It's really like a personal development book, not necessarily a business book. It's both. I definitely highly recommend that book for people. Agreed. And overall, thinking about Eduardo, something that should be apparent is a lot of biotech happens computationally these days. And and increasingly, biotech is going to happen that way. Things, A lot of things will happen on a computer before they ever enter the real world. Yes, there's is still a lot of bench biology that happens that is, and that's very necessary. But companies like Decelogen are enabling this idea of moving so much of biotechnology to the cloud. And I think that that's something that's really important for people to know. As we close out, we were going to talk about Twitter and the change to X and brand value, but we'll save that for next time. I know, Iram, you wanted to talk about Liquid Death, which is a brand story. Yes, yes. So summertime, I've been going to a lot of concerts. If you listen to this podcast, you know, I've been having my fair all girls summer <laughs> this year. I attend these outdoor concerts mainly because I'm a member of this organization. So I get a lot of free tickets. And a lot of times I don't know the musicians. So I ended up going to one concert and the headliner, his name is Dominic Fike. I never heard of him. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. And there was a lot of very young people, I would say high school and early college. And, and it was just packed. And I was like, oh, okay, this might be not my scene. The music was okay, but they had a lot of brands there. And one brand that I think a lot of people are very interested in is Liquid Death. It's the company that's selling water in a 16 ounce can. And there's been a lot of case studies. A lot of people are looking at it because they are marketing geniuses in terms of first the name of the company, the way that they describe or talk about problem that they're solving. So when I was there, the marketing team of Liquid Death, they had a tent and they had a coffin and they filled it with ice and they have a new drink that is flavored water with vitamins. And on the coffin, it said, murder your thirst. They also have an angle of sustainability. And I tried one of those drinks and they are very refreshing. They taste very good. Some of these low calorie drinks have some fake sugars and just doesn't taste great. But right. I will tell you that Liquid Death, they're not a sponsor of Grow Everything. Maybe they should be because we're giving them a lot of credit here. But if anyone comes across a Liquid Death can, read it. Even the story on the can is very interesting. They're on brand with this idea of death. I don't know, pollution. I'm not really sure. Because they are using cans and cans are recyclable. So that's part of it versus using plastic. But I just thought it was very smart. They were at a concert where a lot of young people are very passionate about having sustainable practices. They want to make sure that the earth goes back to the way it was so that they can enjoy it when they get older. But I mean, you've talked about liquid death, Carl, when you had a 
headed up a panel at Zimbaya Beta on evasion of beverages. Yeah, I mean, I'm a fan. A lot of it has to do with like, there's been other form factors for water. We're so used to the plastic water bottle, but that of course is not sustainable. And other people have tried to come along with other form factors. I'm thinking of the cardboard cartons that people have tried to sell water in. Coconut water comes in those cardboard Tetra Pak cartons, but no one had really come along with the liquid death branding. This is one of those cases where the brand made the company, made the brand, made the success. So I think their innovation was the fact that they created this brand. They've got a story. And what is it? A $700 million brand that kind of came out of nowhere. So I love I mean, the I mean, their innovation is the can, the water can. Yeah. Right? Again, I don't think that canned water is the innovation. I think the brand of liquid death is the innovation because I think other people oh. were probably putting water in cans before them, but no one had that death, oh. liquid death concept. Mm. I might be wrong and I'm happy to be wrong, by the way. So if you know better, yeah, I mean, please then correct they, me. Yeah, because if there were water in cans, then they completely failed because I haven't seen it and I peruse the beverage refrigerators because I'm an optimizer. I'm going to pick the best beverage. So I look at everything right. <laughs> to make sure that I have something that tastes good, maybe has bubbles, maybe not. I look at everything and I have never come across yeah. canned water. I never came across it. So like those companies did fail because they never got to the shelves where I've been, which is in like Philadelphia or like I travel a lot. So I just never seen it before. Right. So yeah, congratulations to Liquid Death. <laughs> I said, we'll talk about Twitter next time. But the Twitter story is Elon Musk buys Twitter for a lot of money. And then from one day to the next changes the brand from Twitter to X. And there's a long backstory that we don't have to go into that Elon had this X.com brand that he was building as a financial services company in the early 2000s. And so he's reviving that and he has said that he wants to turn Twitter into a everything app. But I just saw something that the brand value, so a brand like Twitter has developed brand value, which is billions of dollars. But someone had calculated that the loss of the Twitter logo and the Twitter name is a loss of like $20 billion in brand value. So anyway, brands have value and clearly Liquid Death has created a tremendously valuable brand. Okay. I think we can talk about that more because first of all, everyone's talking about the Twitter X. I think next week, I don't know if people are going to be talking about it as much. And I wanted to comment on that saying like, I didn't hear 30 billion. I heard 3 billion in terms of the brand value. 20 billion. 20, you heard 20? Yeah, I heard 20. Okay, so you said 30. So it's tw- but you're saying it's 20 billion. Yeah, let me just look it up. Okay, I saw 3 billion. Here's what's on there. Forbes says that by changing Twitter's name, Elon Musk is wiping out 4 billion to 20 billion in brand value. So I said 30, I was probably wrong. Yeah, well, yeah. I think a lot of that is just an guesstimate. I would say though, they still own the brand. They do still own the brand. So I guess they could sell it, but that's kind of weird. Elon's been thinking about the X and the super app, but there's, he didn't own X.com. Someone, did. someone else actually owned it. Someone oh, okay. else actually owned it. So when they made the change willy nilly, someone else went to X.com and it was like a GoDaddy page. It's like a domain name page. So he had to buy it after making the announcement. Wow. So I don't know. I, maybe we just not talk about it because there was a lot of mis- <laughs> misinformation or yeah. misinformation and like stronger analysis. So we wanted to introduce officially the Grow Everything hotline. So if you have a burning question or comment or any recommendations on guests to interview, just give us a call. That phone number is, I'll wait for you to get a pen or open up your phone. It's 804-505-5553. I'll say it again. It's 804-505-5553. Definitely save that number in your phone. So while you hear us talking, while you hear a guest speaking and something comes up, you can just text our team or you can call our team and leave a voice message. If you have a question that's super interesting, we will play your question on air. Let's get interactive here. Okay, that's great. Hopefully you will call us and you'll let us know and give us some ideas and leave a comment on what we're doing and let us know that you like the Grow Everything podcast. We will talk to you later. So that's the pod. Thanks. 